Air dashing is a fairly common mechanic among fighting games nowadays. Whilst not every game features them, the games that do will employ the mechanic differently. Some games supply it universally and have air dashes that are very freeform, whereas others make it accessible within specific characters of the cast, or has a universal air dash that feels like you're trying to eat soup with a fork. The system is frequent enough to have its own subgenre within fighting games in the air dasher. Whilst many of the games that people think of that occupy the subgenre are considered scarily difficult or complex, the game that is widely considered to be the origin of the air dash wanted to be the opposite of this and create a more approachable game, ironically doing so in a horror-influenced package. Vampire, and its much more discussed distant sequel Vampire Savior, laid the groundwork for a large collection of things that we love in fighting games today, and did so whilst remaining accessible in ways that weren't reductive to the product. I thought it only fitting to discuss on Halloween, not only for its horror-influenced themes, but because it's a little bit scary just how much of this game's influence can be felt today. Even after not having a game in the franchise for 24 years, and how it took a fighting game player's most dreaded word and did it right. Also, even though it's a Halloween video, it's not gonna have any jump scares, except this one. Oh god, bad character design. Vampire is considered to be the first ever Air Dasher released, going all the way back to 1994, just before X-Men Children of the Atom could claim their first Air Dash with Storm. But like any stumble down a flight of stairs into a new mechanic, its Air Dashes come in many shapes and sizes, and don't always look the way that we would expect them to in today's modern age. Whilst we do have a more conventional Air Dash from Zable, characters like Morrigan have dashes that give them an airborne state, similar to Eno of Guilty Gear. Sasquatch, Gallon, and Felicia have dashes that force them into the air, but act similar to the hops of Fatal Fury and whilst I don't think I'd consider them air dashes in the modern definition of the term, it's easy to see them as experimentations of the concept. They want to achieve similar things in that they want the player to be able to access more of their kit, but do so in different ways. Zabel has the goal of retaining his more universal movement, with the addition of being able to have a significant impact on your horizontal position whilst jumping. For most characters, this is a committal positional choice, since jump arcs are rigid and decided once you've left the ground without flexibility. By allowing the player to drastically change their position even after a jump, they make it so that they're able to take themselves out of danger or put their opponents in dangerous situations should they have enough foresight. In the process, you help to create a character that feels more limitless than the characters without an air dash and grants you a new sense of freedom compared to the rest of the cast. A side effect of this type of air dash is IEDs or instant air dashing, which you can tell was carefully considered when making this character. You can't just take any character and make him zoop zoop around, otherwise you'd probably end up making it so that there's no immediate weakness and more importantly you'd make it a pain in the ass to play against. Since he has no aerials that cover directly below him out of an air dash and most moves cover directly in front of him, it makes it so that he's exceptional at covering this mid-screen space, but makes trying to mix up the opponent when you're pressed directly against them difficult, although certainly not impossible. The goal of Zabel's movement design is to create a character that has access to more decisions and has to commit less to their choices to improve accessibility, which can also be seen in his crawls since it allows him to reposition and defend at the same time, but also can't just willy-nilly zoop zoop around like nothing matters. Whether or not they succeeded is another question, however Morrigan and the other aerial dash hop Things hope to make it so that people are more easily able to access a more interesting offensive game by giving them more immediate access to high-low mix-ups. Dracula here, uh, he's not actually called Dracula, but he's he's, cle he's clearly Dracula. Dracula here doesn't have the same kind of immediate access to an overhead, and so against players that understand the very simple blocking system, it can be hard for him to start playing without committing to jump-ins, or waiting until he's got enough meter to do an Akuma. To make it so that people don't have to fiddle with jump-ins to access overheads, they gave four characters dashes that immediately grant them access to overheads by making them airborne during their dash. To make this even easier, Gallon and Felicia have cross-ups off of this dash, allowing them to access left-right mix-ups without having to understand the concepts of a jumping cross-up. This kind of dash helps to give people who want to play a more traditional character access to their overheads quickly without having to master the act of up-forward-forward. And for many of us watching, that might have become intuitive, but for people in an arcade where you can't guarantee that they've even got two minutes out of the womb, let alone playtime, it helps to open up the potential idea space and also demand less of them at the same time. This might not be seen as accessibility by the modern standard. It's not like underneath the colorblind mode there's a dash that does cross-ups and also overheads at the same time toggle. It's accessibility in that the variety of concepts that you need to understand to start having a good time will vary from character to character, making it so that there's a character for everyone without you necessarily having to have a grasp on all the genre's concepts. Which begs the question, why did Zabel's style of air dash spawn a whole subgenre, but none of the other types were nearly as influential? Because the other types of dash certainly do exist in other games, but we don't have cross-up short hop dashes. But Zoop Zoopers are everywhere. I think it comes down to how applicable it is, and how Zabel's air dash adds depth in all aspects of the game, but others add depth within specific instances of the game. Hell, the devs took such a liking to the way that Zabel's works, they reinvented it three times, some of those reinventions being used in other Capcom titles in the future. Whilst the other dashes have a unique complexity, they take away a mechanic in order to do so. You're not going to dash low grab as Morrigan, not because it's a bad idea, but because you're literally not able to do it. No matter how hard I try, it's just something that isn't 
isn't physically capable within the space because it removes traditional dashes in order to achieve it. Zabel's air dash, however, is an additional system that adds additional complexity to the vertical space in a way that the others can't. Since now you aren't committed to the initial jump arc, you open up the potential space and add more variance to where it's best to play offense and best to play defense. This type of air dash spawned a whole subgenre because of how it expands the play field, whereas the other types of dashes simply change the play field that you're on. Now that's not to say that this type of expansion is necessarily a good thing. Street Fighter doesn't need an air dash because it's built around these committal jump arcs that the developers create tool sets around. If you were to add an air dash to this system, it needs to be something that's tailored in a way that works alongside the committal jumping. But if a game is built to be much faster with more potential choices and with different ideas that they want to push as the correct way of thinking, then the Zabel style of air dash allows them to access more of that vertical space and incorporate it with horizontal play space in order to create more characters around it. All right, that's enough beating myself off over the Australian zombie. No, seriously, he's not British. It's an actual outrage. How else does Vampire get new players enjoying the game faster? Because whilst these five characters might have systems that open up the potential player opportunities whilst reducing how much they're forced to understand, we've still got another five characters, or like 10 in this game. So what are they doing? The Magic series is a Capcom staple that you might recognize more from Marvel vs. Capcom rather than any one-on-one -on -one fighter, but it originated within Vampire. Basically, you can go from light to medium to heavy, and so long as the previous move is connected, you'll be able to keep up the combo or the block pressure. This simplistic style of combo might seem like a bit of a redundant factor for the most part. After all, fighting games are complicated for many reasons, and combo complexity is only a very small part of that. But when you're new to a fighting game, it can be hard to not want to just know what the biggest, baddest co blah, 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 combo is and just do that over and over again. But by making it so that the simplistic combos are not only easy to do, but also very powerful, it allows you to turn off your unga bunga brain and make it so that you start thinking about combo purpose rather than just bar go red, hee <laughs> hee brr. A good combo is one that puts you in a position of power, not exclusively by life remaining, but also the options it restricts from your opponent. Corner carry, knockdown, setups, all that stuff that takes resources away from your opponent. By removing emphasis from things like links, special cancels, and a lot of the more complicated memory intensive combo systems, you allow the player to more easily engage with what the player should be thinking about with their combos. What kind of moves do I want to use? What does using this move set up? How can I consistently repeat setting this up? Unfortunately, a side effect of this kind of combo system is that there's not much satisfaction from landing a combo. Since most combos that you'll be landing follow a simple formula that makes them easy to repeat, there's not a huge amount of satisfaction to its combos after an extended period of time. But that's all right, not every single game has to be Marvel. This shit hurts my head and I've been doing combos for years. And not every fighting game needs to implement this kind of simple combo system either. I'm not trying to play Street Fighter V and do this over and over again. This places emphasis on combo purpose rather than combo. Now that's not to say that combo purpose isn't important in other games. In fact, I'd say it's even more pronounced in future titles, but by having a simple combo system, it helps to get players to that method of thinking faster. What helps is that the Magic series isn't an auto combo. You can still have things whiff if you've misjudged the distance, and combos can change to have different outcomes, which helps to distinguish players who understand how to push an advantage from those who are simply mashing left to right on the buttons, even at a low level. A potential side effect of this combo system is that it places less emphasis on special moves as a power tool, and helps to place their potential more in neutral and pressure since it's generally not required to make impactful combos, but instead are tools to control neutral. Which you could debate is a good thing since it makes players look at their more immediately accessible tools, but at the same time you could argue that it disincentivizes players in learning these key tools, which would still be a barrier to playing with more intentionality and make them look at the game as more than a combo counter. But this is my video, so it's a good thing, and if you disagree you can argue in the comments aka the void. But whilst these are quite drastic mechanics to be introduced, there's mechanics that are less clearly on display here that still see wider use today that Vampire, if not invented, helped to push into the forefront of more fighting games. However, that doesn't mean that it was implemented well. In fact, some of the things in this game are implemented so poorly, I feel like Capcom is trying to play trick or treat with my life bar. The push block here, it, even though it's supposed to help with accessibility, just causes confusion. Whilst it acts like the standard push block that you might expect, it's cumbersome to use like a chainsaw made of teeth. For the modern fighting game player, what I'm about to say might seem like some kind of eldritch horror, but push blocking in this game is random. This simply uh, kind of Kinda. Can it's it's kind of random. Hello, it's me, babe. Because in Vampire, push block is determined by the amount of buttons that you press during block stun. However, up until a certain point, that push block is not guaranteed. What does that mean? I had to look up the wiki too. I don't understand either. If you're in block stun and you get three inputs out, you have a 25% chance of push blocking. And then with each successive input, you increase the chances until six inputs where it's guaranteed. Well, that sounds easy. Just press the trip heavy kick and heavy punch macro. Even if that existed in this game, it wouldn't work because the game only accepts one input per frame of block stun, meaning that if you want to guarantee a push block, you have to piano like this.
Mario 64, I don't know, it shouldn't work like this. Here's another jump scare. Oh god, not again. Whilst I can praise this as a very strong concept in that it allows players to feel like they have a sense of control even in defensive positions, the execution of the idea is poor. Whilst this type of input in a vacuum is fine, in this specific circumstance it puts a pretty high level of ambiguity between you and your play and becomes a barrier between playing with intentionality. Reason being is that the same action has variable results and without looking up a wiki or at the time like a, a nerd or something, I don't really know how arcades worked. I lived in a boring town. I never grew up with an arcade. It's impossible to understand. Now the input itself isn't the problem here. Execution here could have been engaging because it's actually got really interesting concepts behind it. If you know that your opponent is mashing push block and they have to do this kind of input, you can hold off on your pressure and bait out a button. And whilst you and your opponent hardly know what button is about to come out, you can create strategies around it. However, the problem comes in that neither you or the person mashing has true control over when that push is going to happen. Because the randomization on when a push occurs causes causes inconsistency and puts barriers between you and intentionality in ways that emotion input just doesn't. Imagine you're playing and you press three buttons and all of a sudden you push your opponent away. You think, oh sick, so pressing three buttons pushes my opponent away on block, nice, and then you go to repeat the action and it just suddenly stops working. And you're trying to wrap your head around what you're doing wrong and try the same three buttons in different ways and different directions and going, what am I doing wrong? And then you do it again at random and you can't really recreate it and it's not that you're doing anything wrong, you're not really doing anything right, but the game is giving you mixed signals. What do you think that that does to a young mind. In future, the man can't sustain a healthy relationship because he can't trust the signals he was getting from VSAP. Why are you doing this to the youth, Capcom? A motion input, on the other hand, puts an execution barrier between you and the game, but in doing so makes things hard and adds complexity for you. But it's consistent, so that difficulty has a payoff when you find the ability to perform the task every time that before gave you an aneurysm. But this kind of input doesn't afford any kind of payoff. All it does is cause confusion and in turn frustration, and sometimes you hit it and sometimes you don't, which turns an accessibility feature into a reason to break down tears at the arcade. Games in future improved on this drastically and did it in simple ways. Push two buttons at the same time and you're all good, sick, which makes for a consistent tool which makes it so that it has the same goal as Vampire but does it with less of a barrier between you and the game, but more importantly does it without an element of randomness for some reason. But even with its really poor implementation, I'm still glad that it exists because it paved the way for so many fighting games of the future and all the other mechanics that came along with it. Even now, even if not every game takes direct inspiration, there's a clear look back at Vampire to see how to make more engaging, fast-paced gameplay. Yeah, maybe not Street Fighter, but games like Skullgirls, Melty Blood, Guilty Gear all take influence from Vampire, some of them more direct than others. Like Beowulf has a little bit of VSAV in there, Eno is paying homage to Morrigan in her movement, Sablewolf probably took some influence, but then again, these games came out like three months apart, so probably not. I'm sure Lots of games took their influence for guard cancels off KOF, but I'm sure some devs took it from VSAV. Point is, Vampire, and more specifically Vampire Savior, is very influential. And whilst I don't want to give it too much credit, tried to do a lot to open up fighting games to a new audience in ways that were expansive rather than reductive, and did accessibility right. Is it accessible today, however? Yeah, but... <laughs> It's so brutal. What is happening here? Someone help me. However, the parts that are inaccessible today aren't because of its mechanics, it's because it's inaccessible because it's been 20 years and people are still playing and they're pretty fucking good. Which is a scary part of fighting games that needs to be overcome by the player without the assistance of the game. Also, it doesn't help that if you want to play on PC, you have to play through fight uh, entirely legal means. What's an emulator? No matter how much a game attempts to help you climb the wall that is ambiguous fighting game improvement, you're always going to have skill gaps. So I think it's admirable that Vampire Savior attempted to bring more people into the game, not by bringing down the potential of high level play, but by expanding the tools to make it so that the skill floor is lower. Which makes for a game that even now is pretty enjoyable at most levels of play, so long as you can find someone who's around the same understanding as you. So in summary, Vampire Savior paved the way for a whole new subgenre, did it in ways that opened up the door for new players without subtracting from people that are already entrenched in the genre, and lastly, please give us an official release on the PC at some point, and maybe a new game in the franchise. Alright, so we got time for one more jump scare, right? Oh god, why? Yo, I just wanted to come through at the end of the video and thank you for uh, not only 10k subscribers, but 20k subscribers, wow. If you wanna follow me on Twitter and Twitch, cause the next video might take a while, uh, that would be nice, but either way, uh, have a nice day, click on video now. <laughs>